Mr. Grozev, uh, welcome in our show. Um, you are the lead Russia investigator of uh, the Bellingcat Collective. Did you see the Russian invasion coming? Well, we kind of knew it was coming, uh, this time not because of open source data. The open source data started showing almost convincingly the aggregation of Russian troops near the border uh, later, in, at the end of January, the beginning of February. But already in December of last year, some sources had reached out to to us, um, sources from Russia, quite close to the Kremlin, trying to warn us that uh, President Putin is really obsessed with escalating uh, both domestically and internationally his, uh, uh, well, the, the heat um, domestically, because that had been happening already for more than a year, tightening of all media restrictions, uh, censorship, prosecution and persecution of uh, uh, journalists and human rights leaders. Yeah. And internationally, a lot of threats were coming from him. But yes, back in December, we already had the feeling that something was about to break. Okay. You mentioned uh, open source information. Is it hard for you to gather intelligence in this, in this war? Well, this war is probably the most recorded war in history. Not probably, certainly. Um, even if you compare it to the Syrian war or to the war in Ukraine 2014, the first stage of this war, we see um, tens, if not hundreds of times of more open source data. Uh, TikTok exists now that didn't exist back then. And a lot of um, even young people in villages are uploading TikTok videos of uh, heavy artillery, heavy armed vehicles moving through their settlements. That didn't exist years ago. We had only a small fraction of that. With the huge data of, of open source um, intelligence that we get now, uh, there are positives and negatives. The negative, of course, is that the governments are also using that to create false plants and false videos. Um, but the good news is that there's so much of authentic data from real people, from real users, that they really swamp the or dwarf the, the fake data. Yes. But how do you verify that? How do you know for sure that your data are valid? We have a very uh, well tried and tested mechanism. Um, it's an algorithm. We go through several stages. One is uh, geolocation, trying to find out exactly where this video was taken based on uh, little elements of the, um, of the setting, the things that we see after, behind the main focus of the, of the video. We try to chronolocate it to find it in time, when exactly it happened, because a lot of the videos that pop up are authentic, but they don't relate to this particular war or incident. They may come from 2015, 16, or from a different battlefield, even different war. Okay. Um, so the most important thing is we have to find several different um, videos, several different open source uh, postings that co corroborate one another. It has to match the context. So we go through this long list um, that ends up with us trying to find the original poster, the first time that it appeared, making sure this is not a government account, but a real authentic person's account. And we then archive this and log it in a way that can be used later in court, because that's what we've decided to do during this war. Yes. So very important in, in this respect, while you're, you're telling us about uh, your method, is what did you find out about the massacre in Bucha? Well, what we find is shocking uh, evidence that not only did this happen um, once, not only did it happen because of an excess of one or or maybe five uh, Russian officers, this happened over the course of weeks and it happened not without support or without encouragement from the central authorities. We've come across um, audio recordings, intercepts of phone calls of Russian soldiers who were based in Bucha or near Bucha and their family members. Um, we validated uh, those recordings that they're authentic because we matched the phone numbers. Um, and uh, what you can hear on those phone calls on some of them is that uh, while initially some of the cruelty and massacres happened because of excesses, then after that central command started encouraging the officers to continue with that, literally with the words, um, every woman, every person who shows up in your, um, in, in your line of fire, treat them as an enemy combatant. And this uh, is something very important because in a future court case, it will show motive, not just uh, that this was a rule and this was centrally uh, dispersed rule. So what you're saying here, and I think that's very important, is that Butcher was a strategy. It was not, let's say, a spontaneous eruption of violence. That is true. What we have seen is that um, 
the third echelon that arrived to Bucha because the first echelon was uh, destroyed by the uh, by the Ukrainians. The second one also lost a lot of people. And the third echelon was shown the uh, destroyed uh, tanks and uh, armed vehicles of the previous echelons by their commanders. And they were told, this is what the local civilians did. So treat them as as enemy combatants. This is a seer, clear sign that this was meant to be used as terror, as something to scare future villages and towns into faster submission. Okay, so very important, I think, that you have the data then. Um, let's, let's turn to uh, the military situation in Ukraine. How do you assess the, the status of the Russian army now in, in eastern Ukraine? Well, the Russian army showed that it's uh, largely incompetent in strategic uh, uh, deeds. It, it hasn't shown that it knows what it's doing. The first stage of the war, they lost. They Even they called it the first stage of the war. They tried to take over Kiev within three days. What we've seen uh, after they refocused on only fighting in Donbass is that there hasn't been significant movement. Yes, there has been a marginal increase of their of the territory that they control, but it is not by today. It is not even all of the administrative regions of the Lugansk and uh, Donetsk Republic, which is the bare minimum that the Russian government uh, must show to their own people in order to show some sort of success. Yes. So what we expect to see in the next few weeks is is really marginal movements back and forth because Ukrainians are also making advances, and the more time passes, the more Ukraine gets new. Um, precision weapons from the rest of the world, and it improves Ukrainians' position, not Russia's position. Right. And what can you tell us, Mr. Grozev, about the, the spirit among the, the Russian military or the, the things we hear about desertion? What do you know about that? There is a lot of uh, unwillingness to fight um, at different um, types of objections and uh, desertions within the different groups. Uh, for example, the um, Chechens, who were a major uh, component of the initial stage of the war. These, these are uh, domestic uh, army troops loyal to Kadyrov, uh, to the ruler of Chechnya. Uh, many of them defected as soon as they saw real fighting because they, they, were, they, think, they thought that they would be there only to take over cities that are already won uh, by the artillery or by the Spetsnaz. But that didn't happen. So they were not prepared for actual hand-to-hand -hand combat and they started deserting. Uh, we see um, dozens, if not hundreds, of Russian units uh, refusing to follow orders and being prosecuted. And actually, this is one way to track these desertions, because immediately their prosecutions opened up by military prosecutors in Russia. And uh, a lot of this is in the public domain. So we can see that by this time, uh, thousands of Russian officers have declined to follow orders. Okay. Now, as you mentioned, um, the Russian progression in the eastern Ukraine is extremely slow. Tomorrow is the 9th of May, this important day in Russia. What, what do you think will, will Putin do tomorrow? What will he announce? I think right now Putin is deciding what to do tomorrow um, because he doesn't have a, much of a win, winning uh, exit. Um, he has to decide between either declaring some sort of marginal victory and hope that this victory at the cost of 20 plus thousand uh, Russian officers and soldiers dead will be acceptable to the population without a social explosion. Or on the other hand, he must say, uh, we have to take this war to the end. And it's a war not only against Ukraine, but against the West. So I declare national full mobilization. But this, again, it will lead, give, give him uh, many more hundreds of thousands of soldiers, of course, which, uh, which he needs to p continue the war. But it will definitely cause a social explosion because a lot of young people are currently not, not uh, interested in going to war and are, will not take it easily. And there will be a lot more defections and a lot more desertions. Uh, let me just say that one of the most frequent um, questions asked on the Russian version of Google, which we are tracking on a daily basis, is when will this war end? That's what most of the people are thinking in Russia. Mm -hmm. And despite how they answer to social uh, polls, which, of course, are never free in such an environment. Okay. Mr. Grozev, uh, thank you very much for your work and also for this interview. And good luck. Thank you. Bedankt voor het kijken. Vond je dit een goed gesprek? Vergeet dan niet te abonneren. Een like of een reactie achterlaten kan natuurlijk ook. Of bekijk een van de andere interviews op dit kanaal.